and we are live let me get my camera on hello everybody hello 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 let me make sure everything is up and flowing good night it's eight o'clock if you don't know who i am i'm b dot belly and you're tuning in to the prophetic remnant bible study um if i have feedback y'all let me know um I'm hearing a little feedback. All right. I want to start off in some prayer, okay? And then we're going to get into um, the Bible study. So let's go. All right. Tell me if y'all can hear this music. Hallelujah, Lord God. Hallelujah, Father. Lord, we praise you, we honor you, and we glorify you, Lord God. We thank you for this opportunity to fellowship with each other, Lord God, to study your word together, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for this opportunity to come into your presence and to receive the truth of your word. You said where two or three are gathered, that you are there in the midst. So we know that you are here with us, Lord God. So I ask you to open up their eyes of understanding, Lord God, so that they will be able to receive, digest, and apply that which they will learn on tonight, Father. I ask that you will bless Bishop Dewan for bringing forth the word on tonight. Strengthen him, O oh God, in the name of Jesus, Lord God. I ask, Father, that you would just touch his tongue, Father. Anoint him afresh, Father. Holy Ghost fire fall upon him, Lord God, that he will burn for passion for your word, Lord God, and for your people. So I thank you, I praise you, and I give you the glory. Amen. All right. So this is the first Bible study for the month of July. We've had the Prophetic Women Conference. Beautiful experience and encounter. God showed up three days straight. Three days straight. And I mean three days straight. Like he showed up. Deliverance happened. Healing happened. Um, the word came forth. And it was a great, great encounter with the Lord. But now... We're back to Bible studies and spreading this gospel of Jesus. And I'm excited because um, Bishop Dewan Corleone is, and I said that a little fancy because I'm a little fancy tonight, um, is bringing forth the word. Uh, you know, we're still in the gospels in our Bible study, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I know that he has something in his belly to release. So I want you to prepare yourself for that which God has for you on tonight. And get your pens and papers out. Y'all know how we do. And get this good old word. So Bishop Dewan, welcome, welcome, and welcome. Welcome to you, uh, Prophet B.J. Bailey and the Prophetic Remnant. Uh, this is such an important time, and I'm honored to be able to speak to the people of God and serve the people of God in this moment so that we can hear what the Spirit is saying to the assemblies or the congregations. Amen. Well, I'm going to go on mute, and you have control, okay? Okay, um, let's get right to it. You know, this Bible study this evening is entitled Repent for the Kingdom of Heaven is at Hand. And this is what Jesus came and taught and preached. And I think it's important now for us to really understand that in light of everything that's going on. But let me put it in context, you know, when we think about salvation, we think it's a one time occurrence that happens at church and we confess Christ and that's it. We get our fire insurance, meaning we don't go to hell now. We got our paperwork and we go about our business and we leave Jesus at the altar because we've been told you just got to have faith and that's it. You want saved, always saved, uh, always saved. The law doesn't apply. The Old Testament's not even relevant. That's why they start handing out those little New Testament Bibles. I always thought that was weird. How are you just going to have just a New Testament Bible? But that's what we've been told. But I'm here to announce 
to the believers, the non-believers, the agnostics, anybody that's listening, what, what Jesus really meant and what he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Actually, it says in the New Living Translation, it says, from then on, Jesus began to preach, repent of your sins. Turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. And so when we go to church now, most churches, they only spend two to three minutes at the end of the service and they do a room check and they try to see if anybody needs to be saved. Are you saved? One saved, saved. Anybody saved, 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 saved. And then you come down front and you go through a little ritual and that's it. We don't put much emphasis on it. I remember distinctly when I was seven years old, all I cared about was hearing the sermon at the church I went to. And then one day I was overwhelmed by the spirit. My heart literally was pricked. And I went down front and I gave my life to Christ. My mom was like tripping, like, what's this seven-year-old? What is he doing? But I knew what I was doing because I heard the call. And so I didn't fully understand what that call was, but this is what it is. So when we're talking about repent of your sins, that's the key. Jesus came preaching and teaching, repent of your sins. Turn to God because the kingdom of heaven is near. And that's not just a phrase. That is a, let's put it into further context as we unpack this. Why it's so important to understand the kingdom and what Jesus actually preached. Because at the end of the day, James, John, Paul, none of these people are going to be able to stand before you. You're going to have to be able to stand before Yeshua Hamashuach and your understanding, your covenant of and understanding the kingdom is what's going to allow your name to be written on the Lamb's Book of Life to enter in. So we really need to know what Jesus said, most importantly. Understand Jesus didn't have a Bible. He had the scrolls. He had the Old Testament, Proverbs, Psalms, the wisdom writings, the prophetic writings. That's all they had. The New Testament wasn't written. Yet people were able to hear the kingdom, understand the kingdom, and become saved. So we got to understand that. So we look here in Matthew 117. It says, basically, what I wanted to highlight is for 14 generations, they were under captivity into Babylon, which was a kingdom. Up until Christ, it was another 14 generations. So when Jesus is preaching and teaching, repent for the kingdom is at hand, his audience knew what kingdom was because they were once a kingdom. The 12 tribes had formed a kingdom. Saul had become their king. David had become their king. They understood kingdom. They understood having to be at war, having to fight other kingdoms and other nations. So when Jesus is saying the kingdom is at hand, at the time, they were under bondage and captivity and the rule of the kingdom of the empire of Rome. So they were excited at first because they're like, oh, we're about to get our kingdom back. We're about to have a physical kingdom come like we had under David, like we had under Solomon. So when Jesus is saying, I know y'all are under bondage and captivity, Rome. Repent. Now is the time to repent, turn from your sins, because the actual physical manifestation of God's kingdom, not a man-made kingdom, but Christ actually on the earth ruling the nations is about to happen. And so they understood that. That's what we don't understand that gets lost in translation with our Western theology. We, you know, America is an empire, kind of like the kingdom, but it's not a Christian kingdom or nation. So we don't really see it. So we see church and salvation different because it's not under the real context of Jesus saying, hey, look, the kingdom is coming. I'm talking about my kingdom, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, depending on how it was referenced. And so we see when he came after that in verse 16, it said those Gentiles, those people were in darkness. The world is in darkness now. They were in darkness and they saw a great light, which was Jesus. They were in the shadow of death when he came. And so the context is in verse 17, he began to preach to a people who were in darkness in the shadow of death 
telling them to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, I could go into the apocalypse of Peter and different apocryphal books that go into detail how dark and what death looks like in hell and the grave. And it is horrible. It's like the worst horror movie you've ever seen when it goes into the detail. And this is what the gravity is. We sit, spend so much time talking about prosperity and all these other things, not realizing when the kingdom comes, it is immediate judgment for people. I get so grieved when we see these rappers get killed and then the preacher shows up. Was well, too late. His fate is already sealed. Either he's whatever he did in his life, if he was in the Lamb's Book of Life, he will be judged for his deeds. And it's too late once the people are at the funeral to get them saved. That's why Jesus was like, repent, turn from your sins. We only spend three minutes at church on this, and people are dying every day of COVID, disasters, all kinds of things are happening. And it's too late once they're dead. But we don't make that the centerpiece of our great commission. We're talking about everything in church, everything on Clubhouse, everything on Facebook. And we don't even check the room. The whole mission that we're supposed to do as ambassadors is check the room. Every room we go into, the highways, the byways, cast our nets into the sea to get fish of every kind. This is what Jesus said when he's talking about the kingdom. This was the primary goal. It wasn't church building and institution building. It was to let everybody know when I come back, when I show up with King of Kings, Lord of Lords written on me with my saints and my angels is on and it's too late. And so if you didn't witness to somebody, if they're not saved, repentant, they're doomed. And people don't like that. They don't want to hear that. You know, they try to judge God. Oh, God wouldn't do that. God's not judging. He's not going to destroy the world with fire. I mean, people in seminary school, when I was in seminary school, they, my professors didn't believe in the book of Revelation. They just believed God was love and there was going to be no judgment and you're saved and you don't have to keep the commandments. You're good. You just do the religious ritual and nothing could be further from the truth. And so when we understand that word preach, Carasso or Carioso, that word literally means to be a herald and officiate as a herald. What that is, if you watch, you know, the war movies, especially in the Middle Ages, a herald would go before the army and say, look, the army's coming. Y'all need to get yourself together because the army's coming through. We're at war. See, we don't understand. We love these songs. We marching in the army of the Lord, the saints. Full armor of God, all these different things we like to say, but really, for real, for real, Jesus, when he preached, that word preached in the Greek, in context, meant he was a herald. It was a herald that was letting the world know everywhere he was going that the kingdom was coming in full authority with the Lord of hosts, with the armies. Here at, and you need to understand that our herald in itself is. It says it's with the duties, including making announcements and marshalling in combatants. It is literally Jesus was coming to declare war. It says in the second de definition, especially in war. So when Jesus is saying, repent for the kingdom of the hand, turn from your sins, understand that, that back in that time period, when a herald came from, from a, a nation, let's say it's England, and they're going to France, they letting them know, kingdom of France, we coming to take over, we coming to execute battle, we coming to execute war, you need to get yourself together. So when Jesus is saying this, when John the Baptist was saying, repent for the kingdom of hand, when John the Baptist in Matthew 3, 1, saying the days came, John the Baptist was preaching that same word in the Greek, he was a herald, he was preparing the way for the war that was coming. We don't want to hear that. We think that being saved is just going to be the good life and, and, and a bowl of cherries, not understanding you are dying to yourself. You're repenting from your sins. You're reforming your time and you are signing up for war. You signing up for attacks, trials, tribulations. You signing up to fight. That's what Jesus is saying. So when John the Baptist came, that's what he was preparing. And so we take 
Matthew eleven twelve out of context. Because when we look at it from that context, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now we understand when Jesus says, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence and the violent take it by force. A better translation is New Living Translation. It says violent people are attack attacking the kingdom. So it wasn't, oh, we're going to take it by force. No, that's wrong. That's complete distortion. It said the prophets up until John the Baptist, if you understand, the prophets were always attacked, killed, beheaded like John the Baptist. But up until now, Jesus has come. Why? Because they represented the kingdom. They understood what the kingdom was. And evil people were all violent people were always trying to attack the kingdom. That's why Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against my ecclesia, which is the correct word. Ecclesia mean called out remnant assemblies. The church doesn't do an accurate translation. Actually, that word church is not supposed to be there. It was inserted. If you go do your research, William Tyndale, who translated the Bible into English, was burned alive at the stake because he wouldn't put church there. The word should have really been upon the gates of hell won't prevail against the assemblies which is when you look in the book of Revelation, you see the seven different assemblies from Ephesus, Smyrna, Philadelphia. So that's the correct context. So Jesus is saying up until now, John the Baptist prepared the way, let people know the war was coming, the kingdom is coming. Not the church, not an institution of church, but the kingdom. Because when you look at where we're headed, you see tribulation and great tribulation. Then you see a thousand year millennial reign of the kingdom on earth with Yeshua. Then you see Satan released from where he was bound and he starts the last war. And then there's a new heavens and earth and God destroys and judges everyone for, you know, their sins and rewards his saints for their faithfulness. That's what, what this really is. It's not come to church have a praise team. Are you blessed? I'm blessed. 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 We blessed in the city. It's not all that. We're supposed to be preparing people for war. Understanding what a herald is. When you preach properly, when you are a real preacher, according to the Greek, when you preach, that it means you are a herald going forth before the armies, letting people know that they're at war. They're charged. That's what heralds do. That's what preaching really is. And I know people don't like fire and brimstone preaching. They kind of made that obsolete. But if you really understood what is coming, it's relevant. Because when the kingdom comes, when Jesus comes, it's not just some rapture. He brings judgment. And oh, it says how the, the world mourns. Because those who are not saved will, will be put in eternal judgment and there will be nothing that can be done. No helping, no repenting. It's done. That's why he says the kingdom is near. You got a chance now to repent of your sins. We have to repent of our sins. That does. So that whole idea of, well, your grace and God's just going to fix it for you. That's completely not true. That's not what Jesus did at the cross. He paid for our sins, but like he told the woman caught in adultery, he told her to go and sin no more. So when you're saved and you repent, you turn from those sins and you do your best not to sin no more. And Jesus, as our high priest, is able to intercede when we fall, but we're not in a state of, of iniquity and keep doing the same things and thinking grace is going to cover us because we're not obedient. We want to be disobedient like Saul and do what we want to do and then think grace is going to cover. We're just going to offer a sacrifice. But Samuel told Saul, you won't, you're rejected of God because you're disobedient. Repenting in the Greek means to change your mind for the better, to amend your past sins. And you got to go in it further. So when John the Baptist sees Jesus coming, he goes through the, Jesus lets John the Baptist know that he's the truth, but at some point he's going to leave and the Holy Spirit is coming. That's the only person that Jesus said was coming. The Holy Spirit was going to come and he was going to reprove the world of sin and of righteousness 
and of judgment. See, that's the theme. Yeah, God sent his son into the world, John 3, 16. He loved the world. But if the world doesn't repent, if you don't repent, and we're going to prove it going through the scriptures, if you don't repent and stay and endure to the end in a state of obedience, because when you look at that word in John 3, 16, it is a present participle, meaning it's a constant verb. It is those who are believing in him. Believing is not a one-time thing you do at church. Believing is a constant state of faith, which is the Greek word pistis, which means trust. And you trust and you obey and you do what he commands and he instructs you to do. That's what kingdom is. And so it's not Jesus got rid of the law when he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And we just freestyle the gospel and we do whatever we want to do. And we rub our Bibles like it's a genie bottle. And Jesus comes out and grants us three wishes of prosperity, prosperous health and everything we want. New car, new house, husband, wife. That's 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 Jesus wants the best for us. But understand where we are, he's going to bless you according to his will and his sovereign will and purposes. But our main charge is to go out here and let everybody know that the kingdom is coming. See, we some of us will look down on these preachers to stand on the side of the road with the sign to say, repent, the kingdom is at hand. There's one of them that's out here by me. We've been out where we live for the last eight years. And this man has been consistently out there every other day. With his sign, repent for the kingdom is at hand. And I just realized this dude is more on point than 99.9% .9 because he's making sure he's getting the word out to people so the love won't be on his hands. So people won't be like, I didn't know. People won't be like, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this and didn't we do that? Lord, I didn't know you required. Look, no, he says in Matthew 5 19, whoever therefore shall break the least of these commandments and teach men so. Shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven. What is that? The kingdom that we're supposed to repent and turn to. He says, whoever shall do people that the kingdom and his commandments are real shall be great in the kingdom of heaven. A commandment is anything God says. God doesn't speak in options. When he says, let there be light, it was a commandment and light had to be. It had no option. When God said, let the ferment up here it does so when god gives a, a command a, a happen his word doesn't come back void he doesn't his words don't come back mock so the commandments are more than just the 613 that were outlined in uh, in the torah which is the first five books of the bible which that word torah in hebrew literally means instructions so when jesus comes and says yeah i know you know the commandment thou shall not commit adultery but i'm gonna give you a new one because everything i say is a commandment and it doesn't come back void. So if you look on a woman in lust, you committed the sin of adultery. So anytime Jesus is telling us to do something, it's a commandment, it's an instruction, and we're required to do it. Because if you trust him, you believe him, you obey and keep the commandments. That's why he says in Matthew 7, 21, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. I, wait a minute. I thought it was grace. I thought you said if you just go down front, get the right hand of fellowship, confess with your mouth, and believe you're good. Jesus says no. You better listen to Jesus. You better listen to Jesus. I don't care who else, commentators, whatever, your favorite apostle, event, what you better listen to what Jesus says. He says not everyone that says Lord, Lord, because if you say Lord, Lord, you're confessing with your mouth that he is Lord. So, but we know he, Jesus comes back and says, even the demons believe they know he's Lord. So just confessing with your mouth without actions, without faith and fruit, faith and works without actions, you're not going to enter into the kingdom. He says, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom, but he that does the will, faith and works, doing obedience. You have to do the will of God, which is in heaven. You just can't do a ritual. We've been lied to, led astray, run them up, fooled by Western theology. 
dare I say, doctrines of demons that have made people feel like it's just grace by itself. No obedience. You're good. But that's not what Jesus is saying when he's talking about the kingdom. Remember, he is the author and finisher of our faith. He is the person. He's the word made flesh. We know the word is his words. The Torah, the first five books. He is that. So who better to be the authority on salvation in the kingdom than the actual person that grants you salvation, that pays for your sins? And so therefore, if grace was just it, if there was a real gospel of grace, which is not, it's the repent for the kingdom is at hand and you believe and you endure to the end and you're obedient. Because Jesus, if that wasn't true, Jesus wouldn't say in Matthew 7, 22. He says many in that day, judgment day, when the kingdom comes back, where he's telling you repent for the kingdom is at hand because I'm coming back. Because when I come back, it's going to be too late. He says many in that day say, Lord, Lord, meaning they know who he is. Some of these people are saved. These are church people. They understand religion. They say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Oh, wow. They gifted. Oh, they got the gift. So the gifts can't save you. You got to have character. You got to have obedience. Oh, so they're like, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied? And these are not just false prophets. Jesus mentioned this more than once, and it was to everybody. Don't believe it's just false prophets. It was to everybody. He says, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in our name? Have we not cast out devils and done many wonderful works? He also repeats this same idea of the kingdom is about obedience in the parable of the 10 virgins. He says, afterward, come the other five virgins who got locked out. There were five wise virgins who had oil, meaning they had oil, they kept oil, they were obedient, they did what they needed to do to enter in the kingdom. There were five foolish virgins who didn't think it was relevant or needed because grace was going to make sure they were going to get in, so they didn't need no oil. But then when Jesus came back, they was like, oops, we ain't got no oil. Can we borrow some of your oil? And they was like, no, you can't borrow none of your oil. But you got to go get it from those who monetize and merchandise the oil. And so by the time they got through going to the marketplace and coming back, they got left out. But they was like, Lord, Lord, open up for us. That's what it said. They're like, Lord, Lord, open up for us. Let us in the kingdom. The kingdom, repent for the, repent. Be obedient. That's why he comes back in Luke and says, why call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say. Obedience, commandments. Do what I say. He, Jesus even gives the parable of the two sons. One, he says, I ain't going to do what you say. He told the father, I'm not doing it. The other one said, yeah, father, I'm doing it. But then the one that said, I'm doing it, didn't do what the father said. And then Jesus said, the one that said, I'm not doing it, actually did it. And then Jesus said, which one is justified? The one that did it. You got to do what God tell you. Grace ain't going to keep you. Grace ain't going to override or disobedience. I'm going to say that again. Grace is not going to override disobedience. If you don't do what God's asking you to do, you're done. This is illustrated by these examples where people wanted to follow Jesus. People who were actually disciples. One of the disciples said in Matthew 8, 21, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Let me do what I need to do so I can get this inheritance because I'm the oldest and I need to go do this. But Jesus said, follow me, be obedient and let the dead bury the dead. Jesus didn't give this, this man grace to go bury his father. You either going to do what I say do, do right now, obedience or, or not. You got the other story of where they come to him and they said, you know, they call him good master. And Jesus says, there is none good, but one that uh, one, one, one good that is God. But if thou will enter, the, enter into life, keep the commandments. That is our charge. If we're going to enter into eternal life, into the kingdom that requires obedience, doing what Jesus said, keeping the commandments. And then there was a rich person that came and he was like, you know, I keep the commandments. And Jesus 
And he said, Jesus, I don't murder. I don't commit adultery. I don't steal. I don't bear false witness. I, uh, I honor my mother as myself. I've kept all these commandments. So what does Jesus do? This is what faith, faith is. Obedience is. It's always constant. It's believing constant. Jesus said, okay, you do all that. I'm going to give you a, another commandment to do. He says in Matthew 19, 21, Jesus said unto him, if thou will be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor and you shall have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when the young man heard that he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. So he was unwilling to be obedient in that. He was a disciple. He was keeping the commandments, but he was unwilling to believe and trust and do what God was him to do in that moment, which was give away to the poor. Now you compare and contrast this with Zacchaeus, who was rich. Zacchaeus was rich and Jesus said, I'm coming to your house. He just said, I'm coming to your house to fellowship with you. And people were upset because Zacchaeus had done them wrong and he had cheated them out. It said in verse six, all who saw Jesus saying that he was coming to Zacchaeus' house, they began to grumble and say, he has gone to be the guest of a sinful man. But Zacchaeus, who was rich, just like the man that was rich, he said, look, Lord, I'll give away half my possessions I give to the poor. And if I cheated anyone, I will repay fourfold. Then in verse nine, Jesus said, today salvation house, because this man is the son of Abraham. Why did salvation come to his house? Because he repented. He reconciled. He just didn't cheat the people and, and go about his business. Even Jesus said you had to leave your gift at the altar and reconcile to those people you've done wrong. Zacchaeus did right to the people. He said, I'm a gift to the poor. I don't have a problem. Money and mammon is not my God. I'll give to the poor. I'll restore back four times anybody that I've done wrong. And Jesus said, okay, this man is presenting what real repentance look like. He's reconciling. He just didn't do people wrong and then go apologize to God and not apologize and restore and reconcile back to the people that he has done wrong. And so when we're understanding repentance and obedience, we have to understand this is where we are. We're in an hour where we're, we, we know God is a spirit and he's looking for those to worship him in spirit and truth, not just come to the mountain, not just go to the building, but God is looking for spirit and truth worshipers. So what does that look like? As we are in the kingdom, we repented of our sins. We're being obedient. What does that look like today in 2022? Jesus said, it looks like, first of all, we got to love God with our heart, mind, and soul. And we don't have to guess what that looks like because he explains to you what that is. He says, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. So if you keep, if you love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, you're keeping his commandments. No need to guess what that is. Jesus told you what it is. And he said, that's the first great commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. On those two things hang all the law and the prophets. He doesn't get rid of the law and the prophets. He just crystallized it into, if you're going to love God whom you don't see, you got to love God, the people who you see, and you got to treat them correctly. And so when you do that, you are basically doing all 613 commandments if you're loving God as yourself, loving God and your neighbor as yourself. It's not this whole absence. And the Holy Spirit uh, works on us and grows us and matures us to where we are able to do these things. But we're not in this state of grace where we just doing whatever and we don't have to be obedient to the commands and then we're good. And then we show up on Judgment Day and we like, Lord, Lord. And he's like, I don't know. Who, who is this? Who is this, Harpo? Jesus is going to turn over to Peter and be like, who is this, Harpo? I don't know who this is talking about, Lord, Lord. And they're going to be like, Lord, I prophesied. I had a, a million followers, a followers. And I had a church. I have franchises all over the country. He's like, I don't I, I don't know who this is calling me. Because they didn't do, they, they taught a false gospel. They believed the false gospel. And they went on this whole tangent and God was, Jesus was telling us something completely different. And so right before Jesus leaves, 
after the cross, this is Mark 16. After the cross, he comes back 40 days, 40 nights. He's talking to the disciples, the apostles, and he sat, sits down with the 11 and he rebukes them because they didn't believe he was coming back. They didn't believe he was going to resurrect because of the hardness of the heart. It says in verse 14, they didn't believe. See, when you really believe, like I have four kids and when they were little, they believed anything I said. If I said I was going to buy this from Toys R Us, they believed it. They just knew it. Whatever I said, they believe I don't do. When you really believe it, if I say y'all going to get in trouble when I get home, if y'all don't do that, you believe it. When you really believe, you believe everything that God is telling you, even understanding his justice and his righteousness. God is righteous. No sin can be around him. So you believe you got to repent and do your best in fear and honor to not fall into iniquity and not keep doing the same things over and over again because you believe that Jesus is a man of his word and he is going to bring judgment on all these people who are still in sin and iniquity. You believe it. Just like we, we would believe when our grandmother would get that switch that we was going to get the beating of our life. We believed it. We knew it to be true. And I don't think we have that level of fear and honor to understand that that word awesome God actually means terrible in a sense. God is something to be revered and feared. I mean, he destroyed the whole world and only saved eight people because the world was in sin. So God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I don't know why we think we're going to get a different God just because people have hijacked the rainbow. Just because they hijacked the rainbow don't mean they're not going to get judged for their sins. That is a lie, lie, lie. So it says that in verse 19, the Lord spoke to them and then he went up to heaven. But before then, he told them in verse 15, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That means Jews, Gentiles, everybody. They didn't have a Bible. So how could Jesus tell them that? Because he told them what the gospel was. It was him coming as king, king of kings, lord of lords. He was the way to enter into the kingdom, to get that access to the kingdom that they have been looking for for centuries. Jesus was paying the price for the sins. No longer it was going to be the atonement offerings that you had to give once a year and the high priest would go in the most holy place and offer the blood sacrifice for your sins they did this all the time jesus blood cleanses our sins atonement permanently if we accept and be obedient not just call him lord lord leave jesus at the altar and go about our business and do what we want to do and think we good because we want saved no the atonement is not going to cover you if you're not obedient, he told the woman, go and sin no more. You can't keep doing what you're doing. Your calling, I have to make this announcement, your calling doesn't supersede your character to allow you to continue to be in leadership. People think I'm called, I'm so important, God need me. No, God didn't need Moses. He replaced Moses. Moses, Moses is better than all y'all Negroes. Ain't none of y'all split no Red Sea. Y'all ain't called, you know, turn your staff into a snake. Y'all don't have no Moses power. So if God would replace Moses and Moses was said in the Bible as the most humble man in the world. And he still messed up and got out of line and got out of order. So he had to get sit down. Why do people think that they can do whatever they want to do in leadership and God's not going to replace them, kill them in their life? I know we're supposed to be focused on the Gospels, but I just needed to put that PSA out there because people are living wild and reckless and because they think they're under some new kind of grace that don't exist that Jesus didn't talk about. Actually, Jesus didn't even say the word grace. If you're honest, if you look at the, the four Gospels, he don't say it. He folks on repent for the kingdom of heaven as it is at hand. So they went in verse 20. They went forth and preached everywhere that message. That you got to repent, turn from your sins, turn back to God because the kingdom of coming is coming because we're at war. We're at war and you need to be on the right side because when this heavenly army comes through, it's too late. You ain't going to be able to get it together. And that's proven 
in Revelation, it says, and I just wanted to highlight the point that the kingdom of heaven is a hand is about kingdoms at war. We see Michael and the angels fight against the dragon, where in verse 17, it says the dragon fought against the remnant. This is the prophetic remnant. The, the, the devil is making war against the seed, the remnant. It says in verse 7 that he was given unto him to make war with the saints. God allowed him to make war. We're at war. If you think you on some Joel Osteen gospel trip, you have completely misunderstood where we at with this Bible. I know where we at is not good English, but I need y'all to get this in your soul to understand. We are at war. We got CERN portals being open and tunnels being dig. We got all kind of stuff going on. Georgia Guidestones blown up, obelisks blown up. We have all kind of things happening in the heavenlies that line up with this I, this reality that the kingdom of heaven is coming to eradicate the kingdom of darkness and we're at war. And this is why he says in Revelation 7, 14, that these shall make war with the lamb. We're at war. It's kingdoms, the kingdom of heaven versus the kingdom of darkness. And the, and the, the gates of hell will not prevail against his remnant his congregation his assembly and those that are with christ yeshua when this trans complete transfer happens are called chosen and faithful we see in verse 11 where jesus is faithful and true and righteous and because god is righteous he has to judge and make war if you think God is just love, boy, are you going to be surprised when you see that fire coming down and it's, you think it's hot right now and you think it's blackouts and power outs. Boy, when you look at what the eternal fire and torments in these places are, you don't want to be on the other side of this kingdom. Revelation 19 talks about the kings of the earth and armies this trying to make war. This is what this is about. This is my last slide. I'm done. But we have to understand this is all going towards a final battle. The final battle where the kingdom of darkness is trying to hold on, trying to prevent being cast into the lake of fire for eternal damnation. And the sad part is so many people are willing to roll the dice with their life eternally and say well god's not gonna do that god's not right god's not fair he wouldn't do that how can how can you expect me to believe in a god that will eternally punish people you guys are crazy to say stuff like this he's god he can do psalms 115 3 says he god does whatever he pleases his righteousness demands this level of judgment and the fact that you think you can judge god what he decides to do with his creation is insane to me. But many people are just going to roll the dice and believe that God's not going to do any of this. And they're going to show up looking shocked on judgment day or when Christ returns. And it's going to be a wrap for them. It's done. and There's nothing you can do about it. That's why it's so urgent for us to spend more than three to five minutes at the end of our church service to make sure people accept, well, first repent. You can't accept Christ unless you repent. Repent for the kingdom is at hand. Turn to God. Turn away from your sins. Repent. Because if you don't, regardless of what your sin is, whatever it is, small or great, however you want to measure it, you're going to be lined up and cast in the lake of fire. And if you die before then, you're going to be sent to torments where you'll be tormented by all kind of crazy stuff. And there's nothing nobody can do about it. It's over. It's done. They could cry at your funeral. They can, they can do all that. Once you're dead, it's done. And I don't think people understand that and get that. When you're dead, it's done. It's over. You're going to be judged by whether you believed and repented and accepted Yeshua as Lord and Savior and were obedient. Or you rolled the dice and think, ah, oh, you know, 
I don't know if it's like that. I, I don't want to believe all this. I'm it, we gonna be good some kind of way. I'm gonna finesse myself into the heavens. <laughs> but that's unfortunate. That is where we are. It is urgent now. We don't know how much time we got left. It's urgent that we repent for the turn from our sins because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning of the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and enter into through the gates of the city. This is the end of your Bible, the end of the story, the end of the battle. And he's still telling people, you better keep them commandments. He ain't say nothing about no grace. He said, you better obey and keep the commandments because you're at war. And I pass the baton to Prophet Beda. And that is the conclusion of a Bible study. We got to repent because we are at war. Well, well, and well. That so was good. amazing. Uh, well, Bishop DeWan, I want to thank you because that is definitely a message that needs to be taught and preached more often. I know when I was growing up, my father, he was a pastor. All you heard about was heaven or hell, child. Everything was heaven or hell. There's no gray area. Oh, you gay? Oh, you going to hell? You know? Oh, you know? Like, you out here committing adultery, you going to hell. Everything was you going to hell. So, um, it, it got a little, you know, redundant because then it was like, well, what about the love of God? But we have to have balance. We can't solely focus on, you know, the 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 grace and, and and the love and not understand we serve a god of judgment as well and that's important because right now we are in a time of judgment and we're seeing that a lot with what is happening in our economy and in the world um like i was saying earlier uh when we were talking before the uh, broadcast new york they did a psa preparing people in case of a nuclear bomb like you don't just randomly prepare people for a nuclear bomb if you've never done that before so obviously they know something you know and we don't have time to keep playing games with god either you're all in or you're all out like you have to pick a side tomorrow is not promised it's not you, you might not get up in the morning and you need to know which where you stand, which way you going go, because hell is real. Hell is real. And as Bishop DeWan was saying, like we are fighting a war. I know a lot of Christians like to think that after they do the confession of faith and Christ is their savior, that you know, life is supposed to be all dilly dally and they make it sound like it's gonna be like sitting on the beach in the sunset. No, it's warfare. <laughs> You know, the enemy comes against God's people and he does it through people. And sometimes, you know, that torment that you go through behind closed doors. Yeah, it's real. People in the church suffering from suicide, you know, suicidal thoughts, depression, you know, mental health issues. Um, it need not be so, you know, and it's because we as the body need to really you know, come into the truth of God's word. Stop trying to over contextualize certain parts of it um, and focus more on one part and not have balance in it all. And understand that, you know, God requires more of us. We can't keep sinning and living a life contrary to the word of God and not expect God to say, well, it's time to pay up. There are consequences for those sins. My grace is no longer covering, and here comes the judgment. So I thank you for um, everything that you have taught us on tonight. This Bible study will be made public not too long after this um, broadcast ends. Um, and Bishop Dewan, if you wanted to say anything else before... Well, yeah. oh, I ahead. just wanted to say perspective is important the fact that god sent his only son to die for your sins for atonement and then give you an announcement that the kingdom is coming so you need to get it together that's all the love you need i mean he's giving you the best opportunity to get saved through his son he's not giving you an opportunity to just keep sinning 
and depend on grace. That's not what he's doing. But he's giving you the opportunity because God knows when you understand, I'm sure you do and you've thought about the kingdom of God or the throne of God, the majesty of God, the righteousness of God. It is no sin. It is absolutely amazing. And if you're going to be in the presence of God, you just can't. You can't do all the stuff that we do. And God is like saying, I want y'all in my presence forever. But this is the conditions that you're going to have to be able to be in. Otherwise, you can't be around me. And so if, and if you're choosing to do life like you want to do it and operate in sin and not repent and not submit to my son as king of kings, Lord of lords, then you have, you know, who am I to argue about how God wants to punish people who don't want to accept the kingdom. I mean, think about it in history. When a kingdom conquers another kingdom, there's grave consequences for the people that are conquered or cast out or beat down. This is what happens. So if you make an alliance and an allegiance to the kingdom of darkness, you're going to be crushed and you're going to meet the punishment of that. God is giving us in his love an opportunity to be in the kingdom of heaven. We just got to accept the terms. And it's not on our terms. It's not going to be on our terms. God is not going to do it the way we want to do it. And he ain't going to be quote unquote fair or amenable to what we think he should do. It's going to be according to his righteousness. So I just really want people to understand that. Yeah, God is love, but he's also wrath. And he likes to fight. It's evident throughout the Old Testament. Yeah. A lot, of, a lot of fighting, a lot of killing and destroying everybody. Remember, he said, kill all of them, the women, children, and the animals. Just get, you got to understand who God is holistically. But he still is a God of mercy, justice, and righteousness. So I just hope people will, will take him seriously and repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I wanted to add something, um, uh, Bishop Thawan. I, I first I appreciate this teaching. Um, you gave me perspective in terms of um, that scripture that we've been using incorrectly when we talk about the uh, kingdom suffers violence and the violence taken by force. So I appreciate that. But um, I wanted to harp on grace and just the way that we've been using it. If we could even look at it differently, because grace, there's different facets to grace, but I think we just hone in on that um, that pardon, right, of sins to so just keep going. But if we could even look at it a little bit further as it's the uh, it's what helps us to still get it right. Like where we fall, where we fall short, it encourages or empowers us to, to keep doing it and to get it or to get it right. Um, where it's something that I couldn't do before, but oh my goodness, I've submitted this thing to God and now I'm, I'm doing this well and I'm doing this certain thing in this area. Well, that's grace. I don't think we necessarily talk about that part, like God being able to empower us to live, to live white, right, to live well. So I think a lot of times we just keep looking at the pardoning of the sin versus like the Lord, I've turned my back from it and God is helping me to, to maintain this, to maintain my salvation. Yeah, if I could say real quick, the word grace in its original context, the first time you see it is when it says Noah found grace. And so the Hebrew understanding of grace was Noah was obedient, he was righteous, he was blameless, and he found grace. When we see grace in the Gospels, it's always attributed to Jesus, not a person, not us, but it was he found grace because of his blame, blamelessness and obedience. And so in him, we have access to it. But it's not something that's apart from him that we utilize like some magic formula. That's a distortion of it. That's why Jesus didn't say the word or talk about it, because it was something that was bestowed on him because of his blameless actions. No different than Noah. It said Noah found it. Because of his actions, God said he was blameless, he was righteous, so he found grace, and he was given the ability to build the ark and save the eight people. And so when we understand the last days are like the days of Noah, you have to look at the Hebrew Aramaic definition of grace to really get its proper context. The way we have distorted it is based on Western, based on the Greek, and the Greek doesn't do it justice. 
because grace is grace. It's not a different grace. The same, the grace that Noah found in, in Genesis 6, 8 is not a different grace, but it's just when we translate it from Aramaic to Greek, it renders different and people in Western theology have distorted it, not understanding how you explain what it really is and how it uh, impacts our, our, our obedience and intimacy with God, if that makes sense. So I'll um I'll piggyback where as we we as the church, I'm talking about those who have confessed Christ. Um, if you're in the world, if you if you don't claim Christ, claim God, our God, the true and the living God, then you know you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, right? You out here living how you living. Um, but for us in the body, you know, I feel like we have treated grace like a plan B. You know, like, oh, I can do whatever I want because I always got grace to fall back on. Like, I can take this grace pill in the morning. I'm going to be all right, and God's going to just forgive me. And, you know, as, as a body, we have to stop giving ourselves more options than we really have. Grace is there to cover, but that does not mean that you should not discipline yourself. If we really delved into the fruits of the Spirit and how we're really supposed to be living and holiness is still right. Um, we wouldn't need as much grace as we keep riding one. And what people don't realize is that grace runs out. And when grace runs out, what then? You know, what happens when that plan B doesn't work? Now you're carrying a baby that you're going to birth and you got to bear the consequence, right, of your action. And I think people need to, people in the body, People who claim Christ need to get to a point of self-discipline, start bearing that fruit of righteousness, of being self-controlled, so that they won't have to abuse the grace. So grace won't have to abound because we continue to sin and treat God like he's just um, a backup plan, you know? And I said this at the conference, and I'll say it again, like, we got to stop treating God like... Uh, like we playing with him. <laughs> we got to stop playing with God. Like for real. And I'm thinking we, because, you know, even myself, we all have areas where we kind of like, we play, we play with God. We got to start really taking God seriously. He is to be reverenced. He is to be worshiped and he is to be honored. And he does not play. His word is his word. And we wonder why we begin to bear the consequences of the things that we're doing, even though we claim crisis, because God is looking like you playing with me. And God's not playing with us no more. God is saying shape up or get left behind. So if you are in the fold, the body, you have confessed Christ as your savior and you have backslidden, you got to come back and right city and reconcile yourself back to God. You have to repent. You have to ask God for forgiveness and you have to change. Now, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you would like to, we're going to pray this prayer of salvation. But just know that, you know, after this confession, it comes with a lifestyle change. You got to be serious. It's a contract. It's a covenant. It's a promise. It's saying, well, I'm going to come under this blood covenant, and I'm going to promise to keep your word and your laws, and you're going to cover me. And I'm going to have access to all your benefits because of the cross. But if you don't keep up your end of the deal, guess what? There are consequences for that. And we can't keep living and relying on grace when God is giving us, has given us um, their wherewithal to be able to do things right the first time. And the way that we can do that is by knowing his word and studying his word. So with that being said, because we are coming to the end of our Bible study, this has been an amazing Bible study and I cannot wait to replay it. I always go back and replay the Bible studies and take notes myself. Um, and this was a good word. And like it was said in the chat, yes, our rainbow has been hijacked and we need to take it back. We need to claim, reclaim God's rainbow, which is our covenant with the Lord. Um, and we got to stop letting the world take what is ours and perverted and we shy back because oh what a love of god and gotta deal with that no we're here for a reason and like bishop said we are in a war the kingdom suffer violence and the violent take it by force we need to take back everything that is ours that the enemy has perverted 
We got to be bold and tenacious for the Lord and defend this gospel and spread this gospel because there are those who want to hear the truth, the good news of Jesus Christ. They want a better understanding. Um, and no, I'm not going to say nobody, but if you really look at it, the mimic church, y'all know how I, I teach. You got the mimic, you got the authentic. The mimic church has put a bad taste in people's mouth for the church, the ecclesia. And it's time for the authentic church to stand up in boldness and speak the word of God in power and show this world who our God is through our lifestyle. So, Chrysla, if you are open to it, well, actually, first, Bishop, Bishop, would you like to pray the prayer of salvation for those who would um, like to accept Christ as the Lord and Savior? Yeah, uh, let's, um, yeah, I'll do it. Lord, we just thank you for your sacrifice at the cross that you are allowing all of us to have access those who would believe in you and your sacrifice and your position as king of kings lord of lords in your kingdom as the thief on the cross said remember me when you come into your kingdom he he, he understood who you who you were who you are and so for those who are looking to enter into the kingdom or rededicate themselves obedience to god we're asking god through your son through his blood sacrifice that you will accept us in graft us in and that we will be obedient that we will repent and turn from our sins we would be different we would do a 180 from those things that we know uh, are dis displeasing to you and the Holy Spirit will let us know those other things that we may not be aware of that's displeasing and that we would be obedient to every command and instruction that you give us going forward so that your will can be done on earth as it is in heaven and that we produce fruit 30, 60, 100 fold. In Yeshua HaMashiach's name, we pray. Amen. Amen. So the Bible says that in Romans, I do believe it's chapter nine, right? Bishop Dewan, chapter nine. Listen, it'd be in my notes. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ came to this earth in the flesh, and if you believe in your heart that he died and rose again, and he's ascended in heaven with the Lord God Almighty, that you'll be saved. That's just the base foundation. But that confession of Christ, you come into salvation. Now you got to put in the work. You got to change your lifestyle. Now for my backsliders, we're going to pray a prayer. Chris, can you pray a prayer for the black backsliders to come back into reconciliation with God? Sure. Um, Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we adore you. We thank you for your, this opportunity to just come before you at your feet and just to confess our sins. You said if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to cleanse us of all of our unrighteousness, oh Lord God. So we ask, Lord God, that we be in right standing with you, Lord God. I ask, oh God, anyone that's here um, on this line that um, is listening, that got something wrong, Lord God, that they'll come before you, Lord God. We're asking that you would forgive us, whether it be a lie, whether it be a thought, whether it's something that we did or something that we said, Lord God, anything that's not in alignment with your word, we ask that you would forgive us. And Lord God, although we're asking for forgiveness, we're also turning away from, Lord God, that we would not repeat this thing anymore, Lord God, but we're continuously walking closer to you, Lord God, turning away from our sins, but walking towards you. So we ask that you would keep us in your precious name, we pray, oh Lord God, amen. Amen. Uh, so it's Romans 10, 9. So I like to read King James. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So now I'm going to pray a general prayer 
I always like to end the broadcast with the prayer of salvation, prayer for backsliders, and then we're going to close it out. Lord God, I pray that you would um, imprint your word on their hearts, Lord God, that they will take what they have learned on tonight and apply it to their lives, that they will repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Lord God, that they will not abuse your grace, Lord God, that they will no longer disrespect or dishonor you in areas of their lives, Father, that they will no longer take you for granted or your spirit, Father. Lord God, I ask, Father, that this will be a defining moment in their life, Father, and that as they go forth, Lord God, that they will boldly declare the kingdom, the message of the kingdom, the gospel of Christ to others, Lord God, knowing that this is a war and a battle. So I ask that you teach their hands how to war, Lord God. Hallelujah, Lord God, and strengthen, Lord God, their backs, Lord God, that they will stand up straight, Lord God, strengthen their feet, Lord God, that they will be able to go forth, Lord God, unhindered, unbound, Lord God, preaching the truth, the gospel. Lord God, I thank you for each and every person, every gift, every ministry that is represented. I ask that you will anoint them from the top of their heads to the soles of their feet afresh, Lord God. I ask that you will restore them, Lord God, in the areas, Lord God, where they have felt, Father, like they have lacked, Lord God. Build them back up, Lord God, and renew their minds in Christ Jesus, Father. Lord God, all the glory belongs unto you. I give you the praise and the honor in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, we are ending this broadcast. All right. Bye, y'all. Bye. Bye-bye.